Good evening. I'm Clara Sartori, president of the Darien League of Women Voters. We are thrilled this evening to have with us Patricia Russo, who is executive director of the Campaign School at Yale. She will address the topic, Lessons Learned, Tales from the Campaign Trail. Following the presentation, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers through the chat room. Patty serves as the executive director of the Campaign School at Yale University, a nonpartisan issue central, issue neutral political campaign training program for those interested in running for office, as well as for those interested in campaign management and embrace the school's mission of increasing the number of women in political levels of government at the local, state, and federal levels. Uh, I just wanted to leave you with one thought that I uh, learned when I was researching Patty's uh, work uh, online this evening, this afternoon. Patty is a nationally recognized leader focused on improving the quality of life for women in Connecticut and in the United States. What a statement. I think that's a great place for me to end and turn mm -hmm. it over to Patty. Welcome, Patty. <laughs> great. Thanks so much, Clara. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you to the League of Women Voters of Darianne, to the Darianne Library for hosting us, and to so many of my rock star friends from Darianne who I see has joined us tonight. Uh, Barbara Cox is a long time good troublemaker with me um, and former board member, I might add, of the campaign school and Barbara Thorne and um, my school administrator is with us, um, Angela Boyle Alto, who's also a Darien resident, some of our uh, soon to be uh, students at the campaign school at Yale this year are with us. Um, Yvonne Klein, one of our campaign school at Yale ambassadors is with us. So I'm really thrilled to be to be back in Darien. I wish we were together and we're getting dangerously close to being able to do that, but I'm happy, I'm grateful actually for the opportunity uh, to be here via Zoom. You know, before the pandemic happened, I barely knew what Zoom was. Now I'm spending anywhere between six and eight hours a day on Zoom. I know all of you can totally relate. And as the extrovert Italian maniac that I am, it was a bit of a challenge and a struggle for me to shift from being out every night to being in all the time. Um, it, it took a, a, a bit of a, it was a bit of a transition, um, but I have so many wonderful pandemic silver linings that not only am I, am I grateful for personally, but also professionally. Personally, my fabulous daughter and her amazing husband, refugees from New York City, spent 10 months with us here, which is really incredible. The best part is that they're, they both love to cook, so I, I, barely, I barely washed a spoon in 10 months. Um, and so it was really wonderful having that family, family time. I know many of you can totally relate to that. And then for the school, you know, a year ago, we had to cancel for the first time in 25 years, our five day intensive at Yale Law School. And that was heart crushing for me. Those, that you, those, that, uh, those of you who know me know how difficult a decision that was to make, but because of the pandemic, we had no choice. So what could we do to help all of these grads of ours who found themselves in the unfortunate challenging predicament of running for office in a pandemic. Who knows how to do that? I certainly didn't know how to do it. And so we started getting many phone calls and emails from grads who were just frantic. You know, I, Patty, I can't go door to door. You know, it was March, you know, March, 2020. Those of you who are political junkies out there know that March is peak, peak door to door season. Who's going door to door in a pandemic? No one. No one's, no one's opening their door for you to talk to you. How do I make sure that my message is being um, heard? You know, with all the fear and the, 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 all of the, the challenges that people were facing, were they really focused on my race? Chances are they were not. Um, between people being sick, furloughed from their jobs, losing their jobs, and then women their childcare was taken, you're, uh, you're suddenly homeschooling your children, you know, 
our grads were disproportionately impacted by COVID. So what could we do to make sure that they would be successful, to make sure that their runs were gonna be effective and that they were gonna win, right, in November. So what we decided to do was we, um, we created a, a series, a online series, Campaigning in the New Normal. And it was um, a different campaign topic every week for 10 months. Um, it became so popular, we were offering it free of charge to our grads initially. But then the word got out that we were running this really great campaign training program. And so we just opened it up to everybody. It was our way of paying it forward and to, to doing a little bit of good in the world. The good news is that the majority of the, the women who um, are grads of our school won in 2020, every, uh, every grad, uh, from the state of Connecticut, uh, who was running for re-election, won well, and who was running for the first time, won. So if you can run and win in a pandemic, you can win, you can win, you know, in normal circumstances. But so um, that's kind of a snapshot of what uh, our life has been uh, the past year here at the school. We are looking forward to um, welcoming our 26th class live online this year. So we will be replicating our five-day intensive live online the week of June 21st. We have 80 students coming from all over the country and the world. And we're really excited about the reach. You know, as a result of being online, so many of the students who are joining us this year don't have to worry about traveling, uh, don't have to worry about hotel accommodations, uh, there are uh, there is a group of women from Texas who are coming who are uh, uh, spending the week at a weekend home of one of the students and they're setting up camp campaign school. So we've gotten very creative, I think, in COVID um, and um, really making the most of what has been a very, very challenging situation. Uh, so we are getting there. We're getting out slowly, literally. Um, it's been really wonderful to be able to go out and see friends again and see family. And I know so many of you can totally relate to that feeling of seeing people. Just when I talk about it and seeing people, I would get so weepy because I've it's really been such a difficult time for us, but things are moving up and things are getting better. So I have this amazing, amazing long time. I, I, I feel like we, I've been a, a member of the League of Women Voters my entire life. My mother was the vice for years. And so her idea of a good time was setting up a card table on the weekends, usually a Saturday in front of the post office or the supermarket. And she'd have bowls of candy to, to um, inspire people to come over to her table and, and register to vote. And so she had us all, I'm one of four, and she always had at least two of us um, with her, um, trying to get people to, to vote, to register and vote. They were actually happy to see her and they would come over and then register to vote or register a, you know, a, a sibling or a child um, of age to vote. So those are my first young, really young memories of the league. I also remember every election day, my mother throwing us all in her Rambler station wagon and driving us to our local uh, elementary school to go into get all in that voting booth and, 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 and vote. So she all gave us the opportunity to pull the lever. So those are my, my earliest moments and joys of the league. And then when I was a senior in high school, my mom came in with five of her trusty girlfriends from the league and registered all of us to vote. We got a lapel pin, a flag lapel pin. It was a very big deal. And I like to think that the reason why I have never ever missed a vote in my lifetime, even when I lived in Tokyo, Japan for three years, was because of that moment, you know, instilling this sense of pride and responsibility uh, to vote. So that's my 
my story about the league and my love for the league, which is another reason why I'm so happy to be back. So I have, there are, you know, a million different ways. I say this all the time when I speak, there are a million different ways to lead. You just have to choose one that's going to work for you. You can work on a campaign. You can choose to run for office yourself. You can work on an issue that you feel passionately about. It's just important that you take the lead. You take a lead to do something, to want do one thing to make the world a better place. Now, I found a happy home <clears throat> running for office, um, not running for, not running for office, <laughs> running campaigns. Um, I had never had any interest in, in running for office. I always said, you know, I'd have to be nice to people I don't care for. I'd have to work on issues that I don't care about. Um, and I, I don't want your phone call at two o'clock in the morning about your pothole. I don't care about your pothole. So I knew my lane. I knew my lane early on. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at George Washington University, I was a poli sci major. And part of the prerequisite at the time was to work for a member of Congress. Well, as a young feminist at the time, the only one I really truly had my heart set to, I'm working for was the late great Bella Abzug. Those of you I know are nodding your heads, you remember Bella, what an amazing leader she was. For those of you who are too young to remember Bella, Google her. Um, <clears throat> I like to ask younger uh, audiences, do you have a credit card in your wallet? Every, every hand is, is always raised in the audience. Well, you can thank Bella Abzug for that because it's thanks to Bella that your father doesn't have to sign your credit application or your husband doesn't have to sign your credit application. And they all kind of look in awe when I, I make that statement. But those of you who know, know that that's true. So I really had my heart set on working for Bella. <clears throat> so I set up an interview. I had a series of interviews that day to be an intern. And I go and I have my new Macy's pantsuit on. I have my little briefcase filled with my resumes. That's how old I am. And I go up to Cannon House office building for my first appointment of the day within Bella's office at nine o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> I go into the office and I meet with a woman who's not much, oh, yeah, oh, not much older than I. We're not even sitting down. We're just kind of in the lobby of her office. And I reiterate to this woman just what an honor it would be to be an intern for Bella. Well, a lot of people, you know, a lot of women your age want to be an intern. We just don't have any, any space. But if we do, we'll give you a call. Great. It took about 30 seconds. So I leave. And as I'm leaving, I see her throwing my, my resume in the local in the waste paper basket right there. Now that's a way to really inspire you to kind of sell yourself for the rest of the day. So I remember going into the Lyris ladies room and just having a talk with myself, Patty, get a grip. You know, you will find something, somebody will have a space for you. So off I went for the rest of the day. I went to Shirley Chisholm's office, Barbara Jordan's office, Liz Holtzman's office, Barbara Mikulski's office, Helen Miner's office, uh, no luck. So it was a day, a very, very long, disappointing day. So just as I'm getting ready to leave for the day, it's about five o'clock and I find myself back in Cannon House office building, which is where Bella's office was at the time. And I go into the restroom and I'm thinking about, okay, I'm gonna have to zoom into plan B. There's gotta be a man that I'm interested in working for in Congress. So I was gonna go back to my dorm room, have something to eat, go to the library and research men, interesting men in Congress. And just as I'm, I'm in the restroom, I come upon a woman who's crying at the vanity. And I go up to her and I was like, are you okay? I will be, I just quit my job. I couldn't take it. I was so stressed out all the time. I'm not even gonna tell my parents I lost my job. I'm just gonna waitress until I figure it out. And so of course, when I asked her who she worked for, you know the punchline. I work for Bella. I couldn't take it. So just as she was saying that, I handed her a tissue because my mother taught me to be a very empathic person. 
I, I handed her a tissue and I wished her well. And I went flying back into Bella's office. I just, I didn't think about it. I just went back. So by now it's 5.30. Those of you who have been on Capitol Hill at 5.30 know what that scene looks like in a member of Congress's office. Pretty much all the staff are gone. If the member of Congress is still there, the key staff people have to be there. So it was kind of a skeletal staff situation in Bella's office. So I go back into the office. I see my resume in the waste paper basket from eight hours, eight hours prior but I have a new resume <laughs> handy. And I see the same woman, same young woman that I started my day with. And I said, I'm just getting ready to leave for the day. But I just, I just wanted to know just how much it would be an honor and a privilege to work for the Congresswoman. And just as I was saying that, Bella came barreling out of her office. She had her handbag on, on, on one arm, pile of papers under another, rushing to a meeting. The phones are ringing off the hook. She takes one look at me and she says, you sit, answer those phones. And that was the beginning of my amazing political career. And it just kind of took off after that. I really got the bug. I loved working on Capitol Hill. I love the parties at night. You know, when you, when you uh, work for a member of Congress, you're just, you're just invited to a million parties and embassies and museums. It was so fun. And it was a pretty exciting life for you know a 19 year old. And um, I remember thinking, this is it. This is it for me. I want it. I want a life in politics. This is what I want. So then when Bella decided to run for the United States Senate, um, uh, primary uh, Daniel Point Patrick Moynihan, I actually moved back to New Jersey so I could work on that campaign, loved it. She almost won, people don't remember that, but she came very, very close. Um, and then I just worked on a series of political campaigns. I found myself in uh, Connecticut in 1978. My husband got into Yale's business school. And so we went from DC to uh, Connecticut, where have we have been ever since. And I've worked on a series of campaigns here. So um, I worked on Ella Grasso's reelect um, right before she died. That was my first campaign. Um, I worked on Chris Dodd's um, US Senate race, the first one. And I did a lot of advance work for him, traveling with him. And I got to the point with him where he would go to events and women you know, were, you know, so happy to see him and we're kissing him and hugging him and he would come out and he'd have lipstick not only all over his shirts but all over his jackets and his ties and so that's when I said to the campaign I said you know I think we need a little suitcase in the trunk of his car extra shirts a blazer a clean tie because he is like a disheveled mess right now I mean he's feeling the love literally but he can't wear the love I know he had a he had a TV, a Channel 3 presentation uh, one day after an event like that. And we found ourselves running to Macy's to buy him a, a shirt so he would look uh, presentable. That's probably one of my most, that what was one of the most fun campaigns that I ever went on, worked on was the, um, the Dodd Senate race. I also worked for our own US Congressman, Christopher Shays. And um, I just saw him actually two weeks ago. Um, he was in Connecticut visiting. A very different experience. Um, Chris, I think, was my first um, full, full, full blast Republican campaign. When I was head of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women, he served as a member of the commission by virtue of him being a state legislator at the time. And many of you were old enough to remember that before Chris became our congressman, he, be, he was a, a state rep. So that's when we got to be very, very close. And when we, when we needed a guy and a Republican leader to, um, to help us pass key pieces of legislation, Chris was always there. So when he decided that he was gonna run for Congress, it was my honor to work on that campaign. And I'll never forget all his very expensive political consultants, all Republicans from, DC were very suspicious of me. 
Um, they thought I was kind of the Mata Hari of the campaign because I was the token Democrat. Everything I, I said, suggested, um, he, he implemented. He always thought I had, I had good ideas, uh, but they really did consider me the enemy. And one of my finest, one, most wonderful moments was with Chris was when we were at a we we're at a meeting and it was just starting and I was just coming into the room and I overheard <clears throat> one of the consultants saying, we've got to get rid of Patty. She's a problem. We have to talk to Chris today about Patty. We've got to get rid of her. And he overheard them talking about me and he went up to them and he said, I just want you guys to know if it's a choice between all of you and her, she stays. So that was pretty, pretty amazing. And I really did have an incredible uh, run on that campaign as well. So I think my, uh, and I can't believe it's, of course it's 725. Um, you know, campaigns are so much fun and doing something that you love, it's hard work. It is hard work but it's so joyful and you're making such a difference in the world and you meet the most amazing people on the campaign trail. I mean, the names of the women that I just mentioned, you know, Barbara Cox, Barbara Thorne, Yvette, Yvonne, Charlotte Suler, Callie Sullivan. I, I know them all through politics um, and there's nothing better. Um, there's, there's, th that's my biggest joy has been doing this work that is so um, so big and so hard, but so rewarding. So with that, Clara, I think I'll stop talking. I have a million other stories, but I think I'll stop talking. And if you want to um, uh, start, um, I don't know how you want to handle questions in the chat, or if you just want people to speak, whatever you'd like, I'd be happy to handle them any, any way you'd like. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Patty. One question that came up is uh, the women, the campaign school at Yale used to be called the Women's Campaign School at Yale. The question mm -hmm. was, uh, why the change? So about two years ago, we started getting calls from the human rights campaign, from our allies um, in the uh, gay rights community, as well as from men. Um, we have always had men come to our school. We've always had non-binary individuals come to our school, um, but we felt that we wanted to be more inclusive. And so that's why we shifted from the Women's Campaign School at Yale to the Campaign School at Yale. So for instance, this year, we have a class of 80, which is always our class number. We have five men coming to our school this year, and I'm really excited that they're coming because they're all running campaigns for women. And as they said in their applications, I've never run as a woman before. I know there are challenges that women face that I don't even have to think about. This will help me be a more effective campaign manager. And of course we have now more um, a, a gay and lesbian um, uh, individuals coming as well. So we just wanted everybody to feel valued, important, and loved and welcome that they will find a happy home at our school. Our mission remains the same. Our mission is to increase the number of women in the political pipeline. So if you embrace the mission, join us. Thank you. Um, you've been uh, involved in so many campaigns. Uh, this uh, person wants to know, what's the funniest experience you've ever had in a campaign? Well, here's the funniest, and it's funny because it's such a generational thing. It's not a campaign thing, it's a pre-campaign thing. So um, we have a, a segment, an hour and a half segment at our five day called Dress to Win. It's led by a former news anchor from DC who talks about dressing for the part, dressing for the job you want and the importance of that. Now, initially, I always get pushed back from some students. Oh my God, that's so superficial. I can't believe uh, you know, I'm coming to your school to learn how to dress. I don't need to do that. The issue is that we want our grads to look 
the part, right? We want our grad to walk in a, in a, in a room, a presentation that she's making and people saying, wow, look at her. She looks like she's got it all together. I can't wait to hear what she's got to say. That kind of levels the playing field, doesn't it? So you're not, I mean, how many, how many conversations have we had about Hillary Clinton and her pantsuits and her hair and her headbands. I mean, enough already. Now Kamala and her, you know, her sparkly jackets. It's like you never talk about men and what they're wearing. Why? Because they have a uniform. And who wants to talk about really? There's really nothing to talk about. So a couple of years ago, I'm at the school. I'm getting ready for this. It was our first day. And here comes a, a, a young woman. Um, with a scoop neck um, top on, um, pants, you know, normal. And she had this huge snake tattooed on her neck. Now, those of you who know me know that I am not easily intimidated. I was quite taken aback by that snake jutting out at me to greet me. And so I just thought she was, she was looking for another classroom. It never occurred to me that <laughs> she was going to be a student that year. I said, hello, can I help you? Like, are you lost? And she said, oh, Patty, it's, it's Ryan. You know, it, um, I'm here for the class. And I said, Ryan, I don't recall the snake on your neck. Oh, I wore a turtleneck the day of my picture. <laughs> Uh, that goes with the application. I said, you're scaring me and I'm not easily scared. You're going to scare and you're going to intimidate your prospective constituents. People are gonna be so caught up as I am, so taken with that tattoo that they're not gonna be able to concentrate on you and what you've got to say. They're gonna be making some, uh, you know, some, uh, they're gonna be, uh, you know, or having some opinions about you that may not necessarily be true based on that tattoo. Oh, no, no, no. I, ha I have to be me. I'm running as me. I said, okay. And a year later, she sets up a GoFundMe to have to, to pay for her tattoo removal. <laughs> so that was kind of, <laughs> that's a, so I do have many, I do have many funny uh, stories, but that one just always kind of, that one always kind of gets me. Okay. Um, next question. <clears throat> what do you think is the biggest issue facing women running a campaign today? I think um, still the, um, you know, the, 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 the amount of fundraising is daunting. You know, we talk a lot about that at our school. Um, the amount of money that you have got to raise uh, to run for office. And you know, many times, for instance, when you're running for state rep, now we're lucky in Connecticut because you know we have state funding, right? We have a matching, um, we have a matching program here. But in other states, people are spending a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars for a twenty thousand dollar job, right? So the fundraising is always, you know, number one. I'd say the most daunting is the fundraising, and um, you know, what what do I what do I have to do in order to raise that money so I'm competitive? I don't have to raise, you know, um, an obscene amount of money. Except if you're running for the U.S. Senate, that some of these congressional and Senate races we all know are just, when the baseline for a US Senate race is $10 million, $10 million, you just, I mean, we had some very expensive US Senate races right here in Connecticut. Remember um, oh, when Chris Murphy was running, when Richard Blumenthal was running, when Linda McMahon was running, I believe she spent um, close to $50 million of her own money per race to run, uh, for, to run for those seats. So I would say that that still is the number one, um, one, the number one challenge facing women. Okay, there's some more here. Uh, how do you encourage women to run against the mostly male quote establishment when many women are intimidated by that? We're really seeing that change. We're really seeing a shift in that. And again, I think, um, you know, what I like to say at the school is we create, create our 
candidates from the inside out. So just by virtue of the phenomenal training that our students receive from um, experts from both sides of the aisle. So they're getting the, the Democratic um, perspective, they're getting a Republican perspective, but they're getting the best. These are, these are consultants that have worked on presidential campaigns. In fact, two of them will be um, uh, training from the White House this year, which is really exciting. Um, so they, they've worked on presidential campaigns, congressional, Senate races. It's that caliber of individual that we're fortunate enough to have training our students every year. So I tell our students that by it's Monday, that by Wednesday, they're not going to recognize themselves just by the experience of being with us for five intense days. We mimic the energy of a political campaign. Those of you who have worked on campaigns know it's morning, noon, and night. Um, we start very early in the morning. We start eight, nine o'clock. We take a break for dinner. And then we break our, our class up into small case study groups where they are up easily until 10, 11, 12 every night working on what will be their case study groups presentation before a Democratic and Republican judge the Friday of our school. So we wanna make sure that you will not be intimidated. You will not. You will be warrior goddess. You will be ready for anything that comes your way. The other part of the work is that you are gonna have a phenomenal five days at our school. We have a one day training that I'd love to talk a little bit about the genesis of that. You will be completely transformed. You will not be the same person that you were when you arrived the first day at our school. You will be emboldened. You will have so much more knowledge and, and you will become more assertive just by virtue of that knowledge. The other thing that we do is we hold on tight to our grads, Clara, when we are beyond the five day. We have a very active coaching and mentoring component to our school. We have a very active closed Facebook alumni page that we just share, the grads just share. Um, I'm looking for a campaign manager. I just had a baby. I just got married. They share everything. You know, and back in 2016, when they were all traveling to um, the respective uh, presidential conventions, we had pictures um, from our grads who were Democrats who were in Philly having dinner with their Republican girlfriends uh, who live in Philly and vice versa in Cleveland, Ohio. You don't see a lot of that. But that's how close they get um, once they're at our school. We are truly a bipartisan school. We've got Democrats coming, Republicans coming, independents coming, internationals coming. And what they discover in learning, just getting to know each other, is that they have more in common than not. Definitely there are, there are differences, but we can be respectful in, in doing more listening and learning than just pointing fingers and um, making statements, outrageous statements. You mentioned one day trainings and you'd like to tell us more about that. Why don't you take this opportunity to tell sure. us about that? So um, uh, back in 2016, uh, right after the presidential uh, election, um, uh, we got a number of phone calls and emails from women who were quite despondent that Donald Trump had won. How could this happen? I was working for Hillary. What are we going to do? Uh, I, I have to come to your school. And they told me how depressed they were. I really did feel like a therapist. Um, they told me how depressed they were. They told me they weren't getting dressed. And I said, you know what? Once you break up with Ben and Jerry's and you're off your couch, call me. <laughs> call me in a month. Right now, you need to grieve. It's a loss. You need to grieve. And then in January in 2017, we saw literally millions and millions of people um, on the first, you know, women's march, you know, that global women's march. And then our, our phones went crazy. Our emails went wild. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm from Akron, Ohio. I'm mad, I marched, I, I wanna run for office. When's your next session, call me back. Now, those of you who know me know that my idea of a good time on a Sunday afternoon is returning phone calls like that one. I was so excited. 
I had so many phone calls to return. I had so many emails to respond to. And the phone calls went something like this. So I'm returning Anna's call. Hi, Anna. Thanks so much for calling. Yeah. Oh, I really need to get to the school. I, 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 I need to run for office. Great. Where are you registered to vote in Ohio? Oh, oh, I'm not registered to vote. You're not registered to vote. No, but I'm mad. I'm mad now. And I'm, I'm going to run for office, Anna. I'm going to save you the $65 application fee. You are not coming to the campaign school at Yale. You're going to register to vote tomorrow. Do you have a pen and pad handy? I'm going to give you the name and, and address of your registrar of voters. You're going to register to vote tomorrow. And I'm going to give you a local political homework assignment to see if you even love politics, if this is really for you. So one third of all the women who reached out to us after that first March were not registered to vote. Just take that in. And I know all of you can appreciate that, the, the, the heaviness of that, the enormity of that. I was so overwhelmed by that. I just couldn't believe there were so many people not registered to vote, but now had decided they were awakened and wanted to, 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 um, to come to our school. That was one third of the calls that we received. The second third. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm registered to vote. I just didn't vote in the presidential because the two candidates were so similar. I just couldn't make up my mind, but I know now, so I want to come. You too are not coming to the campaign school at Yale. I'm going to give you a local political homework assignment and maybe I'll see you again. Maybe I will never see you. Maybe you'll decide to come and come to the school after three to six months of some kind of activism. So you can see the picture that I'm, I'm painting here. Two thirds of the people who reached out to us after that first global women's march were not ready for a five day intensive. Um, and so we started thinking about it, the board and I, and I said, you know, I think we need a one day training. Um, for those who have a newly discovered passion for politics, but need the skills necessary to run an effective campaign, uh, run for office themselves, or just learn how to be an effective spokesperson for an issue that they feel passionately about. So we raised the money and we created the campaign school at Yale, the basics. Some of our attendees tonight um, uh, attended a one day and are now off on their way to our five day. So basically we've created our own political pipeline um, for our five day intensive, because as we like to say, if you have a passion for politics, join us. If you wanna learn more, join us. Um, it's really for everybody to discover what is the right path for me. So we have trained thousands and thousands of um, women and men um, I think we've done, you know, over 30 uh, one day trainings. We've done many overseas. Again, thanks to, to Zoom. I was in Colombia last week, Argentina, Peru. I'm going to Ecuador in July. Um, again, thanks to Zoom, uh, the reach has been phenomenal and as well as going to, you know, uh, our respective uh, states as well. But it's really been uh, just a phenomenal um, opportunity for people to find their way because it can be overwhelming. You know you want to do something, but you don't quite know what. What's going to fit in with your lifestyle? You know, young women who are just starting their careers, um, small children, they're really busy. They don't have a lot of time. Um, and then there are women that are, you know, in other, um, you know, other points in their life when, you know, their children are launched and they finally have space, right? They have time. They have me time for the first time, like in forever, you're not held hostage to a school schedule, right? We've all had that. <laughs> Can I, wow, I don't have to worry about the bus. Uh, so um, there's that. Uh, and and the, I, I think it speaks to, um, 
you know, the, uh, the age range of our grads is pretty phenomenal. I think our youngest grad um, was, I think she came to our school when she was 16. She had worked on four or five political campaigns before she got to us. She was really stellar. And then the oldest um, uh, grad uh, was 70. She had just turned 70. She had just retired um, uh, at, at her job as a, in the school's public school system had always wanted to run for first select woman, but never had the time. But now that she was retired, her children were launched. She had always been active um, in her local political party. She said, I wanna run for office. So she came to our five day. She announced the Monday after she attended our school and she has been in office ever since. And I think she's been in office six or seven years now. So that also is the beauty and the, just the, the, the gift of working with women is, you know, we're constantly reinventing ourselves, right? At, at, at any age. And since we're living longer and we're living more vibrant lives, we have so much more to give. And so that's what's just been so exciting about seeing so many women at different uh, stages of their lives raising their hand and saying, yeah, I wanna run, or yeah, I wanna run a campaign, or yeah, this issue is really important to me. You know, I love telling the story of um, a very dear friend of mine who, again, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, hated politics. Oh, I'm not interested in politics. That would be nothing I would be, I, I'd ever want to do. She had an issue in her local community in Stanford, and she was so riled up about it because no one was helping her that she wrote a letter to the editor. And she said, there's a problem with this sewage treatment plant. If any of you are interested in talking about what we can do about it, please meet me at the diner at two o'clock this Saturday. And she was hoping that 10 people would show up and she was calling her girlfriends to make sure that there would be 10 people. Well, there were over 200 people that showed up at that diner and closed <laughs> that diner down. And guess what? They did get the intention of that sewage treatment plant. And then her political party turned to her and said, you know, you should run for office. You should run for state rep. And she said, oh, no. You know, that's not something I can do. Look at what you've done. You know, look at what you've done already in your community. So she said, okay, I'll give it a try. Well, she ran and she won. And then she became our majority leader. And then she became our first female speaker of the house. And that woman was more reliance of Stanford, Connecticut. Never, ever planned a political career until she had, again, an issue in her community. And that's why so many women decide to run. You know, we run usually, normally, not always, but normally because something is impacting our community that we're mad about and we want to fix. Or something's happening in the school system to affecting our children, our families. That's why women get involved. That's where they find their passion. Um, it's not a power grab <laughs> for women. It's really about um, wanting to get in there, fix the problem and, and get things done. Um, that's so much information. I hate to keep <laughs> asking you questions in a way. Um, one question has come from an audience member. What skills have you found that women need but don't have? Hmm. You know, I think that the biggest challenge for women is there's so many skills that they do have and they don't even realize that they have them. Because, you know, we are, we are the nurturers in our society. We are, we, look, I'm Italian. I'm a mom. I, I, it, it's who I am and what I bring to my political experience. Um, Nancy Pelosi talks a lot about that, about how, you know, being a mother and being, you know, kind of running her household, five children and a husband was more than a full-time job for her. And then she went on to become the Speaker of the House. Um, and so I, you know, I think that there are just so many skills that we just do when we don't even think about. Um, many years ago, uh, Channel 8, it was Italian American Leaders Week in Connecticut. And a very dear friend of mine, one of the anchors on Channel 8, Ann Nyberg, in, uh, 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 interviewed me. And she wanted to know what was it about me that made me an effective leader, which was something I, I had never thought about. I had been doing this work, and many of you know, I've been doing this work a long time. 
it had never occurred to me to think about that. So I started to think about it. What is it? What do I love about the work that I do and the way in which I do it? Well, I am, it comes from my roots as being from being Italian. I love to take care of people. I love for people to feel valued, important, and loved. And that is something that we instill at our school. Um, I love being the safety net for, for, um, for, 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 especially for women. And I'm always a phone call away. I will tell women, if you're thinking about running, if you're thinking about leading a more civically engaged life, why don't you set up a, a Zoom appointment with me and tell me your story and maybe I'll be able to guide you. I love doing that. You know, men do that all the time for each other. Women, not so much. I think we've gotten better at it, but that is one of the hallmarks at our school is to be there for women um, when we, we have not necessarily been there in the past. Okay, um, thank you. We're, can you tell us, I, it seems like maybe I know the answer to this, but can you tell us whether you were ever underestimated as a woman working in campaign management? And if so, when and how did you end it? You know, I think early on I might have been because I wasn't as assertive as I am now. Um, I think, you know, when I was very young and they would say, oh, you're so young and gosh, are you lucky to be in this off in this meeting, <laughs> even though you're so young? Um, and it was really Rosa DeLauro who kind of shook me out of that. You know, it doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, Rosa was running Chris Dodd's uh, uh, Senate race at the time. It doesn't matter how old you are. You have an opinion, you're smart, you're more savvy than most of those guys in that room. You have a responsibility to speak up. And oftentimes um, to this attendee's point, I was oftentimes the only woman in the room or one of two in the room. There would be 10 guys and two women. Um, and, you know, it was kind of, uh, um, a challenge initially to speak. I never felt that I needed to talk just to talk. You know, there are people like that that just love hearing their voices. I really wanted to, I, I always really thought hard about what can I contribute to this conversation? And sometimes when the conversation is so ridiculous, you just sit back and you smile and you just say, I'm not going to be a part of this. But there are many times, and again, it's just practice. It's just um, kind of using a muscle in your body that you haven't used in a while. I, it's just practice. Also, I do have a sense of humor. I have a good sense of humor. And that has really helped me tremendously. So anytime there's been some kind of unconscious comment that's been made about myself, or other women, um, I've been able to, um, I think, pretty effectively shut it down. Um, you mentioned Nancy Pelosi and being mm -hmm. the mom of five. What else do you think uh, makes Nancy Pelosi so successful? Well, she's an incredible fundraiser. So there's <laughs> that, all right? She can raise money like nobody's business. She's tough. She's very tough. She's not out to win a popularity contest. And I think, you know, that's the other thing I think about. Remember the Oscars and Sally Field won that year and she got up there and all she said was, you like me. You really, really like me. Well, in politics, sometimes you've just got to make some really tough decisions as a leader and you can't worry about people liking you. You know, I really, you know, we pride ourselves at the school of being, you know, it's about tough love. There are things that we tell our grads that other people in their lives won't tell them. They sugarcoat things or um, they, they placate them. And we, we just don't think that that serves a woman candidate. We just tell it like it is. So there are some times when we've had very, very difficult conversations um, with some of our grads who are planning a run for office. Um, but they also know that 
it comes from a place of love and kindness. You know, we're telling them this because we care about them, because we want them to win. We want to skew them for success and we will be with them every step of the way. It's not, wow, good luck to you. You know, we, I don't, you know, this is a mess. I don't know how you're going to, I don't know how this is going to work out for you and then leave. We never do that to our grads. Our grads know that we are there for them forever. Good. What, what more could they ask? Um, do you have any other advice for people who are considering running for office? We're kind of coming to the, to the end of our program, I think. So if anybody else has questions here, please send them in. Um, so tell us if there is any advice you would like to give that you know we haven't um, discussed. You know, yet. that's why you should come to my the campaign school at Yale The Basics. You should sign up for our newsletter. I put our web address in the chat. It's tcsel.org. And if you go on our website, tcsel.org and sign up for our newsletter, um, you will um, be notified of our upcoming one day trainings. I do a presentation as part of the one day training uh, called Making the Decision to Run, which is a very holistic, um, comprehensive, everything you need to think about personally and professionally before you even think about running for office. Here's another funny story. Years and years ago, a very dear friend of mine, a guy was running for Congress. He calls me with the good news that he's running for Congress. Now I know his wife hates politics. Patty, I just wanted you to be one of the first one to know I'm running for Congress. Wow, that's great. What does your wife think of it? Oh, wow, I guess I should tell her. Now, can you even imagine a woman deciding to run or thinking about running and not having a conversation, a heart to heart conversation with her family, you know, with her, because it will have an impact on your family. It's going to have an impact on your relationship with your spouse. It's going to have a, a, a definitely going to have an impact on your children. And it doesn't matter when they're little, they're cute and they think campaigning is fun. If they're too little, they bite people. So you may want to keep the, the biters at home. But, you know, when they're young and um, they think campaigning is fun, but by the time adolescence hit, it's a drag and you're an embarrassment, mom, right? So <laughs> it's really important that you have those heart to heart conversations with your family because it's definitely going to have an impact. There was a grad who was thinking about running for state rep and her husband thought it was a great idea, wanted her to run and said, as long as you're home at five o'clock every night to make dinner, as long as dinner's at, on the table at five o'clock. And I just started laughing. This was only a couple of years ago. And I said, you're never going to be home. In fact, if he wants to see you, he's going to have to go out to events with you because you're just not going to be home for dinner until you win. And so she said, well, what am I going to do? I, I, and and I, I said, well, I said, you either forgo your dream to run for office or you divorce this guy because it's just not going to work long term. <laughs> now, I don't usually say that, but it, I had a moment. I just had a moment. And it, a couple of years later, she emailed me happily divorced and running for office. And she, is, she ran and she won and she's serving. So I'm not saying that that's for everybody, but just know that it's going to have an impact on your, on, on your uh, family life, for sure. That's certainly very wise advice. Um, I think this might be our last question. Um, mm -hmm. And you might have touched on it a little. Have you considered writing a book or, a, or putting together a handbook <laughs> that has contained some of your advice? Yeah, well, I haven't thought about the handbook, but people keep telling me that my stories are so good that I really should write a book and that I should do a stand-up comedy routine with the book which I kind of love that idea. I love the idea of promoting the book along with sharing some of the stories um, in the book that I find especially hilarious. Um, just to kind of lighten up politics, you know, those of us who are addicted to all the shows, and I mean all the shows every night, I, it can get pretty uh, dark and dreary uh, pretty quickly when you're over with this tsunami of a lot right a lot but you can find 
your path for jo of, of joy and accomplishment um, working um, in this field in some kind of civic engagement. I mean, you know, again, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna end where I started when I was you know, in, in elementary school and running through the door on Saturday afternoon and telling my father that, you know, oh, we, you know, we registered 50 voters today. Just the, the, the sheer joy of that, you know, the excitement of that, um, that stays with me every day to this day. Well, Patty, your excitement is contagious, I think, and I hope all of our listeners um, take away from it, you know, the, uh, the energy that you give to politics uh -huh. and certainly some of the knowledge. Um, it's been an inspiration having you this evening, and we certainly appreciate it. Um, I signed up for your newsletter today. It's an easy thing to do, so I encourage everybody to do it. And right. again, thank you so much for the oh, time you spent with thank us. You. And thanks to the Darien Library for making the Zoom possible. Um, it, and this will be recorded and um, shown on Government Access TV, uh, assuming that it's okay with everybody involved. <laughs> okay, thank you so much Great. to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.